And be seated. Be seated. Well, we're in our series. The series is titled Thoughts, the Creative Power. Thoughts, the Creative Power. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, it says this, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he or she. As he thinks. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but the heart is not with thee. The Bible teaches us that every person is the result of his or her thinking. You are today what you thought. You are what you are today. You have what you have today because of the way you thought in the past. It's brought you to where you are today. Now, no one is immune to this. Something else that verse tells us might come out of our mouths trying to cover up what's really in there. But what you really are is what you think. Now, no one is immune to this. This is, this is a, a law of God. Every single person is a product of their thinking, every single one of us. Now, that can be good if we take that information and utilize it correctly. See, I can look at my life right now and see how my life is, and I can see that by the way I thought. Do I want to change my life? If I change my life, then I must change my thinking. So I look at it from that perspective. But beyond that, and even more important than that, I can determine where my life goes. Are you with me? I can, I can drive my life. I can direct my life by my thoughts, by where I want to go in life, by how I think. If I am a product of my thinking, then I should be able to direct my life and take my life to wherever I want my life to go by controlling and thinking about how I think. Do you ever think about how you think? <laughs> think about what you're thinking. Uh, but how do we do that? How do we take a good creative thought and direct that thought, empower that thought, and make that thought bring my what I want to, for my life into reality. How, is that possible? Is, is that possible? Can, can we do that? Does the Bible say that's possible? Well, yes, it does. Let me show you this. It's in the book of Mark, chapter 11, and verse 23. Jesus speaking says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever, I, I need you to say whosoever, now, it doesn't say just Christians. It doesn't say that, Jesus doesn't say here that just Christians, uh, it's whosoever. This is a whosoever law. This works for the lost. This works for the saved. It's law like gravity. Gravity works for the lost. Gravity works for the saved. What, this is, what Jesus is saying here is this is whosoever. Whosoever applies this, what I'm about to say, to their life, they will have whatever I'm going to say. Here. So he, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, this mountain, specific mountain, to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not and shall not doubt in his heart. Heart. That's so important. You have to have your heart in this. You, you can't let, let something take your heart out of this. Shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever. Whosoever shall have whatsoever. Whosoever, anyone can have whatsoever anything. This is what he says. Lost, saved, doesn't matter. This is a law for whosoever. Whosoever shall have, shall have, not might have, not can have, but shall have, shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire... Would you say desire? desire? Desire. What things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Them. Okay. Now, I, I want to I make a couple of statements here. Would it be safe to say, according to that verse, that if I wanted something in my life and I didn't have it, would it be safe to say from that verse that the reason or at least a reason that I don't have it in my life is because I didn't do what Jesus just said to do? Is, is it safe to say that? Or was Jesus confused? I want you to notice something in that verse. See, there's, there's emotions in that verse. Jesus said desire. Desire. He used words like believe. He talked about the heart. Your heart's got to be in this. He said, play like, use your imagination like you've already received it. There's a lot of imagination and there's a lot of emotion in imagination. 
And he's, he, he says you got to get your emotions involved in this thing. If you want to take a thought and empower that thought to become creative in your life so that your life can be great, then this is what you have to do. You have to desire and believe. And so he gives us the two principles, the two things that you must do if you want to take a thought and empower that thought and let it become what you want it to, have, want it, want it to be in your life. You first of all must desire, and secondly of all you must Believe that you have received it. Believe that you've already received it. You gotta make believe. You gotta pretend. That's what he said. Now, we're gonna talk about these things. So, let's get started. First of all, he says, desire. Other translations say, ask. But this is a asking with desire. What do you desire in your life? What do you want? For your life. Do you know that most people can't tell you? They give the vague thoughts and vague answers, but nobody really will give you a specific answer. They give you scattered thoughts because they never have a plan of desire. They've never sat down and figured out exactly what they want from life. Their thoughts are scattered, so their answers are their thoughts are scattered, so their answers are scattered. scattered, and therefore their lives are scattered. And we're not focused, and we don't know where our lives are going because we're scattered. We're going over here, then we're going over here, then we're going over here. Thoughts going everywhere. What do you desire? What do you desire in life? Do you know? You want a new job? Do you want a new job? If you want a new job, what job do you want? Where do you want that job? How much do you want that job to pay you? Want a new house? Great. What new house? Where is this house? What color is this house? How many bedrooms does this house have? Want a new car? What kind of car? What color is it? What make model? What do you want? You want a husband or a wife? Well, get specific because you're going to get what you desire. You see, this is what I want us to say. You need to take time, an hour, just an hour, for the rest of your life, one hour today, right now, you took time and wrote out in detail what you desire from life. Where do you want your life to go? What do you want your life to do? What kind of car do you want to have? What kind of person do you want to marry? What kind of person do you want your spouse to be? What kind of, what kind of, 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 of things do you want out of life? What do you want? You got to desire it. You got to get specific. Jesus said, This mountain. Did, is that what he said? Speak to this. Did, do you not think that that's strange that he said, This mountain? You got to get specific. What is your this? This mountain. You need to take time. You know what I want? Now, this is where I'm at in my life. And I'm starting to think about what I desire in life. I want a condominium on Panama City Beach, Florida. <laughs> I don't just want a, any old, con I want a 10th floor condominium on Panama Beach, Florida, right on the beach. It's got big glass doors on the back that lead out to a balcony, big balcony. I can look on the Gulf of Mexico. I can look east to the beach and look west to the beach. I can see the beach. I can see the swimming pools down there under my condominium where I can go swimming anytime I want to. I see the boats going up and down. In my condominium, it has three bedrooms, three bedrooms. It has a 50-inch LCD flat-screen television right there on the wall. It has a jacuzzi. I've got it written down. Because I'm desiring that. Now, I'm wanting us to get there today. Now, you've got desires too, but you've got to desire. You've got to get specific. You need a desire plan, a plan for your desire. Don't be scattered. If you scatter, you're just going to get scattered results. Begin to focus. Jesus says, you got to desire it, desire it. And then what, we, what he says here in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, he says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. What I want you to see in this verse is it's more than just asking. You begin with asking, you begin with a thought. Then you take that thought, you empower that thought with ask, seek, and knock. Seek, desire it. And then knock it around. 
Knock. You, you're going to be interested if you stand and knock on the door of your life what's on the other side. And you get to determine what's over there by your thoughts. Knock it around. Find out. Plan. Make it happen. Because you are what you have by your thoughts. Your thoughts create. Your thoughts have a power to create for your life. <laughs> uh, Jesus said to believe. Believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them. Judy and I, when years ago, before we uh, moved to town, moved to Lafayette, Georgia, in fact, it was in the late 70s, early 80s, I, uh, I got saved in 78 and began to move in this kind of mentality. And we were in debt, like most, most people, and uh, we wanted to get out of debt. We had a thought. We wanted to get out of debt. That was the thought. We began to discuss that thought. We began to knock it around. That thought we began to pray about. We believe that the Lord gave us a plan for that thought, how to get out of debt. And the plan that He gave us not only got us out of debt, but it provided for us a brand new home. That was the plan we felt He gave us. I remember one night late at work, I was writing and I wrote my desire. I wrote down specifically, we're going to sell this house, we're going to take the equity from this house, we're going to pay off all of our bills, with what equity is left, we're going to build another house, we're going to move into this house debt-free, and we're going to live a debt-free life. I, I wrote that down. We agreed on that. Judy drew the floor plan. She says, I want the kitchen here. I want our master bedroom here. I want a big walk-in closet here. I want our bathroom here. I want Lance's bedroom here. I want Bonnie's bedroom there. I want the washroom to be here with their bathroom there. In the center, I want this huge great room with these cathedral ceilings. And we had it drawn out. I took time and drew the outside of that house. I said, okay, here's what the outside is going to look. Here's the front porch. Here's the post. It's got a big tall ceiling. Here's the windows. Here's how you come in. Here's how you go out. We drew it out. We saw it. And we began to live in it. One year later, after we did that, one year later, we're living in this brand new house, totally debt free. Now, what we did is we took a thought. We added desire to that thought. We added works with our faith. And then we're living now in reality. We lived in the reality of a thought. You can do this. Any of us can do this. Jesus says, what you got to do is desire it and then believe that it's going to happen. And you shall have it. You shall. You won't might. You might not. It's not can have it. You shall have it. If you will do what he says to do, you can have it. Now, I want you to, to, Jesus said here, he says, receive them. You shall believe that you receive them. I want you to get this picture. Jesus is coming through the city of Jericho. It's north of Jerusalem, and he's coming down into Jerusalem. It's close to the time that he would be crucified. He's coming through Jerusalem, and of course, the word about Jesus Christ had spread abroad, and everybody had heard about Jesus. Well, there was this <clears throat> blind beggar on the side of the road, outside of Jericho. And as he comes through Jericho, uh, the blind beggar begins to hear all this noise going on. There's this, all these people are traveling with Jesus. And so he begins to ask, what, what, what's going on? What's, what's happening? What's happening? And they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth is, is passing by. Well, well, I, I, you know, you, I, you, you see things and you picture things. Well, I just see this old blind beggar sitting on the floor. And he, he gets up you know, with his cane and he's standing there. You know, with, with his cane, and here, here's the crowd getting, getting coming and getting closer and closer. And, and, he, and, he, and as it gets close enough, he starts yelling out, Jesus of Nazareth, ha have mercy on me. Jesus, J Jesus of Nazareth, I know you're out there. Ha ha have mercy on me. And the people around him say, oh, hush up, hush up. You're disturbing everybody. J Jesus of Nazareth, J Jesus, have mercy on me. And the Bible said, Jesus, stop. He called that guy over there to him to bring him here. Now, here's what I want you to see. Here comes this, here comes this blind guy. Now, blind people are pretty obvious, don't you think? Uh, they he had his cane. They were leading him to Jesus, this blind guy. And what's so amazing here is Jesus obviously knows this guy's blind and obviously knows what this guy wants. But Jesus asked him, he says, what do you want me to do for you? He made him give him his desire. He made him ask for what he wanted. But that's not all he made him do. He had him to do. Let me read you the verse now. It's in 
the book of St. Luke, chapter 18, verse 41 and 43, it says, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. Do you how many think that Jesus knew the guy wanted to see? But yet he asked him. The guy had to request his desire. I want to see. Jesus said to him, and here's what I really want you to see. Receive your sight. Your faith has helped you, has healed you, and immediately he received his sight. Now what I want you to get from this is don't you think that if Jesus healed the guy, that he would have just gotten healed. He would have just began seeing. Right? Isn't that what you would think? Why did Jesus tell him to receive his sight? He made him ask for what he desired, and then he said, receive it. That seems strange to me. But see, when you hook what I just told you up earlier, that you've got to not just desire it, but you've got to believe that you receive what you desire. What this old guy had to do was believe he could see. And when he believed he could see, he began to see. What the Lord is trying to get us to see today is you've got to believe you can see what you need and what you want in your life. You can't just desire it. If you just, you gotta, you gotta go beyond that. You gotta, you gotta see it so much that you, you're experiencing it. You gotta, you gotta know that it's real. You gotta get beyond just a mental reception or a mental belief in it. And you gotta move into a higher dimension of belief. Jesus said, believe this as though you have already received this. Believe it. Now why? Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to pretend? D doesn't that seem weird to you? Why do, why do we need to pretend that we have already received something that we haven't received yet? Here's a fact of life. Here's a fact of life. In life, we do not get what we want. We get what we expect. Is that right? We don't get what we want. We get what we expect. You mentally possess, you have, every single one of us has mentally possessed what we've been experienced in the physical first of all we've mentally everything that you've gotten that's precious to you you mentally possessed it first and then you physically experienced it this is how it works there it can't just be a mental ascension to believe it's got to be a possession of it mentally and then it happens it happens all the time to us See, the principle that we looked at last time that we talked about this is the principle that we saw in Genesis. It's a law of God. And a law of God just doesn't work every time. A law of God works all the time. Now, somebody says, what's the difference? Well, with every time, it's like you get to determine when it works. You get to, like a, like a, a VHS player. You are a CD player, whatever. You get to put it on pause. You get to play it. You get to stop it. You get to start it. You don't get to do that with the laws of God. How many can stop and start gravity? Stop and start a solar eclipse. Stop and start the sun from coming up in the morning. It's a law of God. This is a law of God. It says that like produces like. After his kind, everything produces after his kind. Seed in itself. Like produces like. It's the law of God. And whatever thoughts you are sending out are the thoughts that you're getting going to get back. That's the law of God. The seed is in the thought. The thought produces your life. And whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, that's what he is. Right? So what thoughts you're sending out, if you're just sending out desire and asking, what are you going to get back? And that's not a trick question. If you're sending out what you're going to get back and you're sending out desire and asking, what are you going to get back? More desire and more asking. And so tomorrow you desire and you ask for the same thing. What do you get tomorrow? Desire and asking. But if you're believing and you're seeing yourself live in that and you're believing that you've already possessed it, what you're sending out is what you possess and you're sending out thoughts about what you possess. So what are you going to start getting back? Thoughts of possession and you're going to have it. Whatsoever you believe that you've received, that's what you're going to get. So it's an it's a attitude that we adjust, we, we, we come to the place in our lives where we do, we, we, we make believe, we, we play, we, we pretend, we, we, we experience these things. Jesus said, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. 
Is, is he really talking about make-believe? Is that what he's really talking about? Yes, it is. You've got to... Intellectual belief is not sufficient. Belief includes you're already having it. Jesus wrote this. Oh, Jesus didn't write this, but this is what it says about what he said in, in the book of Mark. They were trying to bring children to him. And, and this is what the book of Mark says in chapter 10, verse 14 through 15. It says, when Jesus saw this, they were, they were keeping children back, the disciples was, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Christians are lost people or people far from God. What does it say? Anyone. Anyone. Whosoever, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What Jesus is saying here is it's okay to make believe. It's okay to use your imagination. Why do you think he's given it to us? It's all right to play and pretend. It's okay to make believe. Because when you make believe and you become as a little child, you have access to everything that's in the kingdom of God. Jesus says that the kingdom of God exists of things that give you an abundant life. Anything you want, anything you need, anything you desire is in the kingdom of God. And he says, you have access to it if you'll become like a little child. And let your imagination and your thoughts bring it to you. Whosoever shall have whatsoever. How many of you have ever done this? Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever said something like this? I wanted it so bad that I could... And what happened pretty quickly? You got it. Why? Because you mentally tasted it first, and then you physically had it. You had dreams, and your dreams were so real. You saw colors, you heard sounds, you had smells in your dreams. You, 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 you maybe felt the sun on you or the breeze on you, but it was a dream so real, and you knew it was a dream. But then one day, deja vu. You walk into this dream in reality and you think, I have been here before. But you know you haven't. What caused that to happen? Your thoughts. You smelled it. You tasted it. You experienced it mentally. And then you experienced it in the natural and physically. A used car salesperson, or a new car, a salesperson, a car salesperson wants to do what to you? When they get you on that lot, what's, what do they want to do? They want to sell a car. Now, how do they sell, the, sell you that car? Get you in that car. Right? And you get in that new car. You're feeling it. You're smelling it. Am I right? Turn that stereo. So you're hearing it. Oh, smooth ride. Air conditioning. Ooh, it's good. And if this one doesn't feel right and you get back on the lot, what do they want to do? Get you in another one. And they're going to keep moving you around until they get, one, get you in one that feels right. Because they know if they get it feeling right, you're going to, do, you're going to bust the bank to get that car. Because you desire it. Am I right? You know I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Give the Lord a hand clap. I want you to get this. I want you to see this. <laughs> feels right. You got to begin to taste it. You got to begin to feel it. You got to begin to smell it. You got to feel it. You got to feel it. What would it feel like if you really had it? What can you do to make it more powerful? Do, if you want a new car and you want this particular car, then go drive it, feel it, taste it, and imagine yourself. You want a house? Then where is that house? Go find that house. Look at that house. See if they'll let you go in that house. But find, feel it, taste it, touch it, experience it. And then, and then you begin to imagine having it, and then you have it. Because you want it so bad, you can taste it. <laughs> and this works all the time. Whosoever shall have whatsoever, if they take a thought, put desire to fuel that thought, and then to begin to receive as though they already had it. I was in Florida uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I, had a, I have a real nice boat. I still have it. it was, it's a 17-foot uh, boat, um, nice boat, and, and does, it's done a great job for me, but I was in Florida a couple of years ago, and and I had a thought, you know, I'd like to have another boat, a bigger boat. 
And uh, so I'm out there fishing. I watch these boats go by. I said, I'd like to have a boat like that. And I began to think about that boat. How would that boat feel to fish out of? You know, how, how would that boat ride on the waves? How, how would that, you know, oh, man, they got all these nice things, this nice top on them, you know, keep the sun off of it. Oh, I'd like to have a boat like that. And I, I became like a child with it, didn't I? <laughs> I'd get me magazines, and I'd, oh, I like this, and I'd call it, I'd look at it, and I began to imagine myself in this boat, how it would feel, how it would, how it would be, you know. And then, sure enough, about a mile from the condo that we were staying in that summer, there was the boat. I could see it in my mind, and there it was. I pulled in, I got in the boat, I was feeling that boat, I was experiencing, I know the, I know, and I said, so the salesman comes out, he says, he says, you want to go for a test? And I, yes, I do. <laughs> few things had to happen, but two days later, I'm on the Gulf of Mexico in my new boat. <laughs> you know where that boat is now? Behind my house. That is my boat, and that is a nice boat. What I'm trying to get you to see is that this works, and you've got to go through the process if you really want to fuel a thought and let that thought drive your life and take your life to where you want your life to, to really, really, really be. You've got to put your heart in it. Jesus says you can't doubt with your heart. You can't, you got to put your heart in it, but keep your heart in it. Don't let doubt take your heart out of it. You got to feel the emotions of it. You got to sense the smell of it, the taste of it. You got to pretend as though you've already had it, had it. See, when we first came to this town, uh, I, I told you about the house that we built there. It was a brand new house. It was a really nice house, big house. And, uh, we came to town, and, and, and we had spent all our money investing it in, in church and, and those kinds of things. And, and so we were living in this shelter. <laughs> it was a house, but it wasn't a nice house. And it, was, it, 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 it protected you somewhat from the rain. Um, the roof leaked, and the plaster would fall on our face at night in the bed. And it, it was depressing. And, uh, and I was all consumed down here at the building, fixing and building, and, and, and trying to get the church moving and going. And, and uh, Judy was there at the house, and, and that, in that house. And, and, uh, and so one day the Lord came to her and said, uh, Judy, what do you want? And Judy gave the right answers. You know, she said, I want the church to do well. I want Delbert to do well. I want to bless people. I want to minister to people. And, and, you know, and, and she's playing the religious prayer. How many of you do that? How many of you, you, know, you, you want to give the Lord the right answer, right? And that sounds like the right answer. But let me show you what Jesus said about giving those religious answers. He's speaking here in the verse that I'm about to read you to the Pharisees, to those people that prayed the right prayers and who said the right things. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8. It says, do not be like them, for your father knows what? Knows what you need before you ask him. Okay, if he knows what I need, then why should I pray? What about what you want? See, Jesus is teaching us in Mark 11 about how to get what we want. Not what we need. What do you want? He didn't, the Lord didn't ask Judy, what did she need? He asked her, what do you want? So finally, she gives him the answer. She says, I need some new clothes. We've spent all our money. We don't have money for me to get new clothes. I want to get some new clothes. And I want to get out of this house. I want my own house. I want a big house. I want a nice house. That's what I want. So a few days later, she goes out to the mailbox. There's a check from a woman that lives 120 miles away from us. Yeah, wrote her a check. A little note in there, Judy, I just had it on my heart the other day to send you some money so that you could buy you some clothes or just whatever you want to get. Now, was that coincidence? Sure it was. Come on. A couple of days later, the leadership tells me, Delbert, go find your family a house. I go and we call the realtors and we hook up with this real estate guy, this realtor, and he takes us north and south and, and east and west, and we ride this whole county looking at houses. All day long, we're just looking at houses, and, 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 and none of them felt right. I could not see our family living in any of those houses. None of them felt right. And all day long, finally, one afternoon, we pull up into this driveway. I'm looking at this house up on this hill, big house. I say, I like this house. I began our family, I began seeing our family live in this house. We went in the house, we liked the house. We began to see ourselves live there. We could do this, we could do that. You know how you do when you, when you look at that? You know, we could fix this, we could do this, we could do that, this. So we made an offer on that house that day. Now, 
our offer was not taken. Now, I'd done everything right, I thought. I liked it. I believed it. I received it. I, I, did, you know, I lived in it. I'd done the whole thing. But we didn't get the house. Well, we wouldn't settle for anything else. This is the house we wanted. We'd seen 50 houses that day. We didn't want any of those. We could not say So we would not settle for, for less. Now, we would have taken something better, but we, didn't, we wouldn't settle for anything less. And we kept looking and kept, you know, nothing ever worked out. So about a month later, I get a telephone call from the owner of that house. He said, Delbert, the people that were going to buy the house didn't buy it. The loan fell through. So I'm ready to take your offer if you still want my house. <laughs> yes, sir, we do. Two weeks later, we're living in that house, and I've lived there for 20 years. I got a lot of equity. <laughs> Terry said, you got condo equity. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? See, you begin by a thought. You take that thought, you fuel that thought with desire. You add to that believing that you've received it, you live in it, you feel it, you experience it, you, 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 you want it, and, and, it, and it eventually it will come to happen. Now, some things you just wake up overnight and there they are. Some things take a while, but it always works if you will keep your heart in it and you will keep after it. And you all have stories like this. Every single one of us have stories like this. The nicest things that you have begin with a thought. Tell me I'm not right. The nicest things you have began with a thought, something that you desired, and then you began to create it. You began to create it in your mind. You began to live it in your mind, and then, then it expanded, and it became reality for you. But what the Lord is saying to you today is He wants you to do something more. He wants you to do something more. He wants you to start taking that now and make something big in your life. Drive your life with this. Direct your life with this. Have the life that you've always wanted with this. Because Jesus said, whosoever shall have whatsoever. Empower your thoughts and create the life that you want. Now, I know this works, and I think everybody here knows this works. So why, if we know this works, why do, not, why do we not continually live in this? Why do we not continually cause this to continue in working every day in our lives? Why do we allow other things to come in and take us away? Why? Here's the reason. The reason is our focus moves. Our focus moves. We'll allow doubt to come in for the thing that we want, and we'll allow doubt to take our heart out of it, and we'll stop asking, we'll stop seeking, we'll stop desiring, we'll stop knocking, we'll stop, we'll stop wanting it. We'll stop, we'll stop doing what we know we're supposed to do. We'll stop imagining it. Or we'll get busy with other things and have a lot of other thoughts going on. And we stop focusing on the primary thought. Uh, ask you a question. How many thoughts do you think you have a day? You ever thought about that? You ever think about what you think? How many thoughts do you think you have a day? Any idea? Anybody want to throw up a guess? How many? Thousands. I, I, you know, there's people that count those things. There's people that do that. Anyway, I, I did research and I wanted to find out. And so, and so what I found out is that we all vary somewhat because of what we do and how we live our lives. But from the lowest to the highest, there's always the variances. But the lowest level is like 12,000 thoughts a day. And I'm going to read you a few quotes here. I think it's going to help us understand what I'm trying to project to you. Several years ago, the National Science Foundation put out some very interesting statistics. I'll say that three times really quick. Uh, we think a thousand. We think a thousand thoughts per hour. <laughs> let me let me start over. Several years ago, the National Science Foundation put out some very interesting statistics. We think a thousand thoughts per hour. When we write, we think twenty-five hundred. 2,500 thoughts in an hour and a half. The average person thinks about 12,000 thoughts per day. A deeper thinker, according to this report, puts forth 50,000 thoughts daily. Let me read you another quote. <clears throat> in terms of my protocol, in terms of mind-body technologies, number one, I have people find out how their mind actually works, how many thoughts they run per day. And the average person runs about 15,000 thoughts per day, in which at least half of these are negative. And we, 
know that our thoughts turn into our emotions and our emotions turn into our physiology, our body functions. In other words, your thoughts create emotions and emotions create your body to do whatever your body's doing. Then there's one more thought, one more, one more quote. We have approximately 50 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Unfortunately, 95% of those thoughts we had today are the same ones we had yesterday. Now, we have 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Everybody in here has 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts every day. And according to those experts, at least half of those thoughts, which would be 6,000 to 30,000, are negative. And those negative thoughts affect your emotions and your body. And now, topping all that off, we repeat the same things tomorrow. So not only are we having uh, 6,000 to 30,000 bad thoughts today, we have those 6,000 or 30,000 bad thoughts tomorrow, and then we have them Tuesday, and we have them Wednesday, and we have them Thursday, and we have them Friday, and we have them all month, and we have them all year, and then we wonder why our families are a mess, or why our marriages are a mess, or why our children are a mess, or why our finances are a mess, or why our bodies are a mess. Our minds are running wild. The Apostle Paul said this in the book of 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, capture every thought. <laughs> now, I consider myself a thinking person. I write a lot. So I put myself into the 40,000 thought a day category. Oh, let's do 30. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll believe 30. 30 to 40,000 thoughts a day I have. And Paul said capture every thought. How, how you do, if all I'm doing is catching thoughts, I'm not accomplishing. I'm just catching thoughts. How do you do that? How do you keep focused on your primary thought, the thought that you want to have that's going to take your life to where you want your life to go? How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, the best way that I know to tell you to do it is with a focus board. Okay? I've begun me a focus board. Focus board. On my focus board, here's the church. We took this photo of this, of this church when we had about 400 people in here. And it's, it's, it's filled with people. What my, my, my thing that I want to see happen is I want to have this church filled with 400 people three times a week. I want a, two Sunday mornings and I want a Saturday night service where this church is filled. And so I'm, I'm wanting that. I'm desiring that. I'm wanting, I know how that feels. I go to other churches and I experience how big crowds feel and how it sounds and the excitement of it. And so I live that. I experience that. I pretend that. I imagine that. Here's my condo right there. My condo, my wife, my grandkids. I don't know what this is doing up there. And then, and then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> get, me, get me in trouble. Anyway, here, here's, here's where here's, here we are on the beach. And all, all of my family comes and visits us on, on, the, on our beach. <laughs> here's the sunset from that beach. Here's the, here's the view, the sun setting from the condo. I know how it looks. I'm experiencing that. Here's my grandson catching a fish with me on my boat. Here's my other grandson. Here's what Jesus said and would make all this happen. If I desire it and I power that thought, then I can have it. That's what he said right there. And so I walk, walk by this. It's in my office, and I walk by it several times a day. I'm in my office nearly every day. And so I'm walking by this thing. I'm walking by my, my focus board. And though my thoughts may be going crazy, and though I may be, I may be angry or I may be upset, well, I'm walking by my focus board, and I say, oh, i got to focus. And several times a day, I am forced to think about it. A great place to put a focus board. We all need some sort of focus board. You need something to, to cause your thoughts to focus. Jesus would pray or meditate, and he would go off in the mornings or in the afternoons or at night, and he would go off and he would focus his thoughts. And we all know what kind of a life, powerful life, that he had. A, a good place to have a, a focus board would be your refrigerator. You're in there several times a day, right? <laughs> good place for it. 
The best place would be your bathroom. The first thing you see every morning, right over the commode. <laughs> the last thing you see at night. You know, in your bathroom. Oh, what a wonderful way to start your day with your focus. What a great way to go to sleep at night. Because how, much, how many would rather think, go to bed thinking about what you really want your life to become than going to bed thinking about what happened for, during your day? You had a bad day. You got angry, you got fussed at, you got mad, you yelled, you screamed, you got kids and wife and husband and go to bed thinking about this. Release those thoughts. Those thoughts create. What does anger produce? Thoughts of anger. What do they produce? Anger. Do they? If I yell at you, Terry, what are you going to do to me? Not yell. You know, see? <laughs> you're going to yell back. You're going to get angry, right? We all do it. Flip somebody off. What do they do? Let's be real. Come, I know nobody here does that, but let's, let's just be real here. Hey, get mad, shake your fist at somebody. They, what do they do? Sure. But if you send out good stuff, you send out good things, what's coming back? Good things. What the Lord is wanting you to do today is, what do you want? On the back of your gateways, I've listed just some things, maybe to, just to cause you to think. What do you want? What do you want to have for life? Where do you want to go? How much money do you want to make? What automobile do you want to drive? Where do you want to live? What kind of house do you want? Drive your life toward those things. Think about those things because your thoughts are who and what you are. Your thoughts produce who you are and what you have. Drive your life towards those things. Empower those thoughts. Jesus says we can empower a thought by desire and by believing you receive it. Jesus said, whosoever shall have. Jesus said, whosoever shall have whatsoever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us and being with us today. Thank you for making us see, forcing us to see that our thinking is so powerful. Though maybe it's never been pointed out quite like this, but you make us realize that our thoughts really do produce. So Father, I pray that each person here now receives this, receives this teaching, activates this teaching, gets them a focus board, begins to focus and direct and drive their lives to where it needs to go, where they want it to end. So I ask you to bless us now in Jesus' name. Head still bowed and eyes still closed. You've gotten away from the Lord and your focus has gotten on all kinds of things and you know it. You see, until you get your life right with Christ, you're never going to get your mind right. And he says, I come to save your souls. You're never going to be able to really focus on what you really need to focus on. And you got away from Jesus and you're not where you want to be with him. Maybe you've never received him as your Lord and Savior, but you want to. So what I'm asking you to do right now, if that's you, I'm not going to ask you to come up here and shake my hand, sign a membership card. Just, just lift your hand and say, Lord, I want to get closer to you so that I can, I can really focus my thoughts on what they really need to be. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up? I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. See your hand? See your hands? Any others? Any others? See your hands? See your hands? Any others? Hold them up just for me, just for a second. Any others? Father, right now, I bless them.